Hello everyone and welcome to round 6 of the 1972 World Chess Championship match between Robert James Fischer and Boris Vasiljevic Spassky. And now if you remember in game 5 um, Spassky uh, allowed Fischer to immediately go for the Nimzo Indian defense and he was really up for a big fight. Uh, he, tried to create he tried to create chances for the entire game but uh, Fischer equalized very early in the game. Uh, and in the end it was actually Fischer who won that game and it was a very important game to win uh, as it uh, equalized the match. It's two and a half uh, points each, this is game six and everyone thought that this game would uh, have a huge toll on Spassky. Fischer, as we already said, celebrated uh, in the pool uh, and uh, Spassky, he wasn't sad or alone in his room or anything. He was, uh, as usual, uh, just playing ping pong uh, with his uh, second, his international master friend, uh, Limone from Estonia. And uh, uh, the fans from Iceland, the children, were uh, returning balls as, you know, they were playing ping pong and Spassky always thanked them afterwards. So it's not like uh, anything was different than usual, even though now the, the match was equalized. So this is game six and it's very interesting. Uh, for, I forgot to mention this during game five. Uh, during game five... Um, Miguel Nidorf arrived. Uh, he had a flight from Buenos Aires, and uh, everyone said that if if Miguel Nidorf arrived all the way from Buenos Aires, then surely uh, the match will continue, and Fisher will not uh, bail on the match because it's a very expensive flight, and uh, Nidorf would not risk it. Uh, so there you have it. And also, uh, Nidorf, uh, you know, uh, offered us some insights to how Fisher manages to uh, so easily convert uh, such tiny advantages. He said, uh, Nidorf said that Fisher. Uh, doesn't uh, uh, think of uh, chess as uh, most of them do, uh, because Fischer has all of all of these uh, positions, all of these positions from games that were played so long ago, uh, and uh, Fischer doesn't uh, study how to win a certain position. Uh, rather, Fischer is more interested how a player lost a certain position, which move was crucial uh, for him losing that game. And Fischer memorizes uh, these losing moves that convert uh, a holdable position into a losing position, and uh, it's very very. Uh, difficult to surprise Fischer uh, to enter such a position that will not be holdable. Uh, Spassky had such a chance uh, in game 4 with that rook to d8 to h8 maneuver but he missed it and now it's uh, t totally a different match. Uh, so okay, uh, game 6 uh, and here as the quote says above the board, uh, expect close openings from Fischer. Something Viktor Korchnoi often said during uh, uh, Spassky's preparation in the training camp, uh, but everyone was like, nah. Uh, and even the newspapers, they were often uh, depicting uh, this whole match situation, uh, where always the drawing of Fischer and Spassky was with Fischer pushing e4 with the white pieces. And there were even jokes like, but Boris, what, he, what if he doesn't uh, play e4? And uh, to this, Spassky always uh, responded, I'll just play the Tartakover variation. Uh, I mean, I've never lost a game with the black pieces in that variation. What can Fischer possibly uh, use to surprise me there? Uh, but as in Tal Botvinnik, uh, game, uh, game, uh, game 6 Fischer versus Spassky will also bring uh, some very nice ideas. So let's uh, check it out. Uh, like the quote above the board suggests, indeed, in this game Fischer does play c4. And uh, it's not the first time in his life Fischer played c4 in a tournament. He did use it against Polugevski in the Palma de Mallorca 1970 interzonal tournament. Uh, they, uh, they drew that game. And also he tried it uh, in the last game of the Palma de Mallorca interzonal in 1970 against Oscar Pano, but Pano resigned that game without even playing. Uh, so, okay, e6 by Spassky, knight to f3, d5, we have d4 by Fischer. So we enter the Queen's Gambit declined and although it's not the first time Fischer played c4, uh, this is the first time Fischer plays the Queen's Gambit declined with the white pieces uh, in his entire career. Uh, so like we said, will Spassky do what he said he would do if Fischer indeed doesn't open with e4? Uh, so let's see, knight to f6, uh, we have knight to c3, bishop to e7, this is all standard theory of the queen's gambit declined, uh, bishop to g5, we have castles, uh, e3, uh, h6, kicking the bishop back, bishop to h4, and now b6. We have the Tartakova variation, and indeed uh, Spassky does, uh, <laughs> does what he said he would do. 
Uh, C captures on d5, knight captures on d5, bishop captures on e7, queen captures on e7, and the knight captures on d5. We have e captures on d5 and now rook to c1. This is a well-known position of the Tartakover, so nothing out of the ordinary here. As Pusky develops uh, the bishop to e6, bishop to e6. Uh, you could also develop it to, b develop it to b7, but uh, it, it's, it was kind of known that at some point c5 will be played, and then if captures captures, then the b-file could become open, and then the bishop might be somewhat vulnerable. So instead, uh, he develops it to e6. Uh, we have queen to a4, also it was a well-known move. Uh, c5 by Spassky, and now comes this queen to a3. Simply uh, piling up on the c5 pawn and also pinning it, you cannot push c4. This would be excellent if you could, but you can't because the queen on e7 is undefended. Uh, rook to c8, uh, adding more defense to the c8, uh, c5 pawn, and here comes the bishop to b5. An excellent move by Fischer, uh, which... Uh, kind of makes it hard for Spassky to develop his pieces. Uh, you can't really develop the knight. If you develop it to d7, that's kind of the whole point of the bishop to b5 move. Uh, if you develop it to d7, uh, Fischer will simply grab it. Uh, play b bishop captures knight on d7. Uh, you will lose the defender of the c5 pawn. You, the queen will be misplaced, and uh, then you will be able to capture on c5. So this is the idea. Uh, but is this Fischer's idea? Is this a novelty? Uh, in fact, it's not. And it's interesting, uh, once again, Fischer plays a variation that was played uh, in the 1970 in the Soviet team championship uh, between Semyon uh, Furman and uh, none other than Effingeller. So it's like Fischer purposely plays variations that um, at some point Effingeller found himself in. And it's like it's like Fischer knows that uh, Spassky will not remember what uh, Geller told Spassky. Uh, so, okay, very interesting. Uh, we have a6, Spassky wants to kick away this bishop. Uh, and it's um, not all that easy to get rid of this bishop. Uh, for example, if you try something like bishop to d7, uh, Fischer will simply go back bishop to e2, and you still can't develop the knight because now the bishop uh, is uh, covering this square. And of course you don't want to <laughs> play it to c6 because you have to keep an eye uh, on the c5 pawn. And if you try to, to repeat moves, then you will lose a tempo because now Fischer has already developed the bishop. Uh, so instead, after this bishop to b5 move, a6 by Spassky. And it's not really uh, an attacking move, since uh, the pawn cannot capture the bishop just yet. Uh, as the rook on a8 is unde undefended, the rooks are uh, not connected just yet. Uh, so okay, d captures on c5 by Fischer, and here we have b captures on c5. If you play rook captures on c5, it's not all that impressive. Uh, Fischer can just castle. You still can't capture here because the queen is undefended, and you still can't capture here because the rook is undefended. Uh, so b captures on c5. Uh, we have castles by Fischer, and now comes rook to a7. And this is the problem. This is the same move... Uh, Effing Geller played uh, against Furman in the 1970 Soviet team championship and uh, after that game, not immediately, but uh, sometimes during uh, the 1970, he mentioned this to Spassky and he said that uh, instead of this rook to a7 move, I could have equalized quite easily with queen to b7 uh, following up with queen to b6. And uh, had Spassky remembered this, he surely would have played it. Uh, but Spassky doesn't remember it, and he simply repeats what uh, Geller played against Furman in 1970, uh, which is rook to a7. Uh, now the rook is defended, and uh, at some point, surely a captures on b5 can be played. Uh, so Fischer simply moves the bishop, but we have bishop to e2, and now comes knight to d7. Uh, you have to develop it, but there's a really no good way not to do it. Here you allow this knight to d4 move because now your rook is unprotected on c8. Uh, but even if you tried some other way of uh, dealing with this, for example a5, it doesn't really matter. Rook to c3, uh, Fischer would simply threaten to double up rooks on the c-file, and at some point you would still have to develop the knight, and now after rook to c1... Uh, queen to d8 uh, on pinning, but now bishop to b5, and we get a very similar position to what happened uh, in the Furman versus Geller game in 1970. Uh, the knight is getting eliminated, and the defender of the c5 pawn uh, will be lost. Uh, or, or c4 will be played, but uh, in, in any chance, this is what happened in the Furman uh, versus, uh, versus Geller. Uh, so, knight to d7 immediately by Spassky. Uh, we have knight to d4. Now, you cannot capture the knight, of course, because the rook is undefended on c8. Uh, we have queen to f8, and here, 
Uh, it's it, it's a nice idea because the queen is now guarded, but uh, now uh, it allows Fisher to uh, simplify into a better position. Knight captures on e6, f captures on e6, uh, and now you could play something like bishop to g4, which is of course possible, uh, simply trying to pile up on this pawn, but queen to e7 defends it and black is uh, perfectly fine here. So instead Fisher plays a, a much better move because... Uh, uh, of black, uh, if you look at the black rooks, a uh, rook on a7 isn't all that impressive. Okay, the rook on c8 is very nice. The knight really still has to find what to do with the knight. And uh, one thing black does have uh, going for himself is a very nice pawn center. So if uh, black can stabilize this, black should be fine. So Fisher immediately attacks it. He pushes e4. And now you really have to decide what to do here. Uh, do you push this pawn, do you push this, this pawn, do you capture here? Uh, because with this maneuver, if you capture, then simply rook to c4, uh, you're gonna double up rooks on the c-file, you're gonna win the c5 pawn, uh, the double d pawns uh, are very weak, you're gonna win them eventually, so uh, it's, a, it's a much better position for black. Uh, Spassky isn't interested in this. Uh, so in this position, Spassky actually uh, pushed d4. And here we have a moment... Uh, Botvinnik mentions this, that uh, this is the crucial moment in the game. That up to here, okay, uh, you didn't play the improvement Geller mentioned to you, uh, that queen to b7 to b6 maneuver, but here you should have played c4. Uh, c4 immediately offers uh, a trade of queens, and okay, uh, Botvinnik mentions that after queen to h3, going after the e6 pawn, uh, queen to f7 defending, uh, you could try uh, bishop to bishop to h5 to dislodge the queen uh, or bait the g6, but uh, the queen will ignore you. So uh, bishop to g4, Botvinnik mentions uh, rook to e8, defending the e6 pawn and now captures. Captures and here rook f to e1. Uh, rook captures, rook, uh, rook captures on e1 and now uh, since it's a... Uh, direct translation from Russian uh, of the Nikolai Krogius book uh, in the translation on chess.com there is uh, it says like Botvinnik uh, said king to f8 uh, but king to f8 of course doesn't work uh, but feel free to pause the video here and uh, find uh, how white would win in this hypothetical situation it's a it's a very nice uh, little combo uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds uh, uh, to decide whether you want to do it uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations, you are an excellent solver of hypothetical situations. Uh, and for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it's actually queen back to a3 check. Uh, the rook is covering the e-file, so you do have to move the king. Once you move the king, bishop to e6 simply wins the queen. Uh, but I'm sure uh, it, it's a wrong translation that the idea is not king to f8, but rather knight to f8 simply guarding... Uh, a d6 square, uh, the person who translated it probably just wrote uh, k for a knight, but k is a king, n is a knight. Uh, but still, I thought it was uh, very funny. But yeah, Botvinnik says that white is better here, uh, but still white would have to really, really prove that he is a, a much better player to, to actually push this for a win. Uh, but instead, after e4, Spassky pushes d4. Uh, and okay, uh, we have f4 now. Uh, here, Fischer, uh, for once, uh, increases his control of the e5 square, not allowing knight to e5, not allowing this pawn to be pushed to e5. Uh, but one other thing uh, that is now possible, the queen is now uh, coming to h3, uh, and this bishop is coming to c4 to pile up uh, on this e6 pawn. So, okay, queen to e7. Mm, you have to move the queen off of, off of the f-file. Uh, and now Fischer pushes e5, an even uh, stronger grip uh, on the position now, the f6 square is taken away from the knight. Uh, so what do you do here? Rook to b8. Uh, Spassky tries to create some chances along the semi-open b file. Uh, bishop to c4, S uh, Fischer simply continues with his plan of piling up on the e6 pawn, and here we have king to h8. Uh, Spassky doesn't want to keep his king on this diagonal because f5 is definitely coming. Uh, for example, if you try to defend knight to f8 to bring a defender of d6 pawn this way, uh, f5 is coming, and now there's really nothing to do. f6 is coming next, and uh, black is completely uh, uh, <laughs> getting destroyed here. Uh, so, okay, after this uh, bishop to c4, Spassky plays king to h8, and now we have queen to h3, as planned, simply piling up on d6 pawn. Uh, now, you don't really gain anything by capturing the b2 pawn, it's a pretty useless pawn, uh, white will simply grab this central pawn and create a passed e pawn. Uh, so here, knight to f8, simply defending here, and here Fischer simply improves, b3. Uh, Spassky pushes a5, 
uh, hoping to get a4 in at some point and here Fisher says okay now it's enough I have a light square bishop uh, you have so many light square weaknesses it's time to break through here Fisher pushes f5 and okay we have e captures on f5 rook captures on f5 now uh, and now knight to h7 hoping to either get knight to g5 in and it seems like you know when your opponent plays a move like this uh, you might think, okay, my opponent just uh, totally gave up, he's just playing nonsense moves, uh, but it's actually a very poisonous move. For example, <laughs> you'd think that, okay, I have a bishop on c4 controlling f7, I could simply play uh, rook to f7, the queen has to move, I'm gonna win this rook on a7. Uh, but this, this would actually be a huge mistake, as now you're losing the game as white, knight to g5 wins the game here. Uh, after you capture the queen, black captures your queen with check, you have to capture the knight and then rook captures, uh, black is up the exchange and winning this game. So, you know, even though it doesn't matter how good your position is, you always have to be careful of, of such tricky moves. Uh, but And okay, Fisher simply uh, doubles up rooks, rook c to f1, uh, and now comes queen, uh, queen to d8. Uh, he, uh, Spassky doesn't want his uh, queen to be available for this queen to f7 maneuver, uh, and also to introduce more defenders to, to the back rank, and also to perhaps at some point start pushing his own pass deep on. Uh, queen to g3 by Fisher, an excellent move that uh, is preparing a lot of uh, a lot of mating ideas. Uh, also, at some point, this pawn will be pushed to e6 and queen to e5. This beautiful centralizing move uh, is definitely uh, in the preparation. Uh, rook to e7 by Spassky. Uh, you have to try and activate your pieces. This is uh, this is Spassky's idea. Uh, h4 by Fisher. Uh, simply not allowing this knight to come to g5. If Spassky, instead of rook to e7, tried knight to g5, uh, then h4 would just kick the knight, uh, knight back, knight to h7, and now rook to f7, there's really nothing to do here. Rook captures, rook captures, there is the threat of checkmate on g7, so there's really nothing to do other than queen to g8, and now e6 is coming with the threats of rook captures and queen captures on b8, once you move the rook, for example, rook a8, e7 is coming, and now there's really nothing to do, rook e8, uh, <laughs> rook is coming to f1, and the queen is lost. Uh, so after queen to g3, uh, rook e7 instead of knight g5, but simply h4, Fisher improves the position. Uh, rook b to b7, introducing uh, another defender of the g7 pawn, but now comes e6. Uh, also, uh, a very nice idea, now, now the f6 uh, square does seem to be available for the knight, but everyone knows that once this knight comes here, that Fisher is just gonna gobble it up. Uh, rook b to c7, as now after e6 the c5 pawn was under attack, so Spassky simply defends it. Uh, queen to e5, as planned, Fisher uh, <laughs> places his queen on this beautiful centralized square. Uh, queen to e8. Uh, but what else is there? If you, if you try to push the pawn, it doesn't work. Uh, simply rook to f3. Uh, the pawn is attacked twice, once you push to d2, rook comes to d3. Attacks the queen, once you move the queen, uh, simply grab on d2, there's there's no way to take advantage of the passed pawn. After queen e5, we have queen to e8, and now comes a4. Uh, with this a4 move, Fisher puts uh, Spassky in sort of a tukzwang, and uh, you do have to play something. You can't play the rook, uh, all of the squares for the rook uh, are not available due, <laughs> due to the pawn. Uh, this rook has to keep an eye on this c5 pawn. Uh, you know that if you play the knight, uh, Fisher is just gonna gobble it up, so there's really nothing to do here. Spassky has to wait and see what Fisher will do. Uh, Fisher simply... Uh, plays rook to f2, uh, probably <laughs> looking for a breakthrough. Uh, we have queen back to e8, and now rook back to f3. Uh, we have queen back to d8, now the, the d3 square is covered twice, but now Fisher simply goes uh, all in as everything is set. Uh, bishop to d3. Uh, now you can see that uh, the queen is coming to e4, and the bishop-queen battery will be very unpleasant along this diagonal. Uh, queen to e8, still Spassky doesn't really have any moves, and now comes queen to e4. And now you can see that if this rook was gone, you would simply have queen captures on h7 checkmate. So there are a lot of nasty discoveries here. Uh, and you have to move the knight. Knight to f6 is played, but now comes rook captures on f6. Uh, we have g captures on f6, and now comes rook captures on f6. So what do you do here? There are so many threats here for white. Uh, king to g8 is played, not allowing rook to capture on h6 with check. 
And here, a lot of moves are winning. For example, you could simply capture on h6 and uh, go from there. Uh, but like in Mor <laughs> Morphe's uh, Opera House game, this would be uh, a butcher's move. And Fisher, like Morphe, is an artist and uh, he does not uh, use butcher's moves. So bishop to c4. And here, there really is no move to play. Uh, the, the threat is rook to f7, for example. Uh, if you play a waiting move such as rook to h7, uh, rook to f7 wins the game. There is no defense against queen to h7 checkmate. Uh, if you capture here, then pawn captures will, uh, of course, cost you a queen. Queen captures, and now even queen g6 check. Uh, you can't capture because of the pin. Uh, you'd have to move king f8, and now captures, captures, and captures with check. A queen against the rook, uh, easily winning. Uh, so after bishop to c4... Uh, Spassky tried king to h8, but now uh, Fischer simply played queen to f4, and now there is really nothing to do here. Uh, there are so many winning moves here, uh, but the most obvious one is rook to f8, and there is there is no move that can defend against rook to f8. Bl uh, Black simply loses a queen, uh, and after that uh, checkmate will follow. So this is... Uh, uh, move 41, uh, it was in this position that world champion Boris Pasky resigned the game. Uh, Fischer won uh, game 6 and uh, in this moment uh, Fischer took the lead in the match. The result is now 3.5 to 2.5 in Fischer's favor. So not only did uh, Fischer win such a beautiful game, but for the first time in this match Fischer takes the lead. And now this uh, surely will take a pretty huge toll uh, on Spassky. Uh, if uh, a lot of you have been mentioning this in the comments, uh, yes, I've seen the movie uh, Pawn Sacrifice with Tobey Maguire. Uh, and yes, this is the moment where uh, thousands of people were applauding Fisher for his uh, beautiful positional uh, play. And uh, with them, Spassky also stood up and Spassky also started uh, applauding Fisher. Uh, Fisher later said that uh, this was simply too much to take uh, uh, because he considered Spassky an adversary and that this moment truly touched him and that he, he had to leave immediately, that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't watch Spassky uh, applauding him. So a very nice moment uh, f for history and for chess. I uh, uh, really do hope you enjoyed it. And uh, later Spassky said uh, that uh, Fischer... Uh, he said that he was very feverish and impulsive, uh, perhaps the pressure before the match and in the first games took its toll. But I want to give Fischer credit as well, his win in the sixth game uh, was very good. So uh, even praises along with applause from the world champion. So yeah, uh, really, really uh, amazing stuff here. <laughs> I mean, I really, really had... Uh, a lot of fun preparing this game using the book by Svetozar Gligorovic, using the diary by Nikolai Krogius, uh, using uh, all of the available materials, using uh, uh, the interview with Anatoly Karpov. Uh, I, I read the two books I already mentioned by uh, Dmitry Bielica, one on the move, Bobby Fischer on the move, one, uh, uh, no, it's uh, my friend Bobby Fischer, the other one is Boris Paske on the move. So a lot of very, very useful information, a lot of vast knowledge. Uh, in this, but every time I revisit this this whole match, uh, I always uh, find out some, uh, something more and uh, increase my own vast knowledge. So yeah, uh, that's game six. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank um, uh, Asamalab, uh, Chi Chung Ho, uh, Ryan McKnight, Ralph Vida, and Felix uh, Klostermeyer for contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and uh, I will see you soon, uh, hopefully, with another interesting video, most likely continuing the Fisher series uh, with Game 7 of this historic match. Thank you all, and I'll see you soon.